You're all very welcome to Mediterranean Maluth on this wonderful June day. My name is John O'Brennan. I hold the Jean Monnet Chair in European Integration and direct the Centre for European and Eurasian Studies at the University. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, today at this extraordinarily important time. I think it's probably a consensus in the room that we've experienced this period of great ferment since the 24th of February when Russia attacked Ukraine and it's thrown up all sorts of questions about the nature and the future of the European International Security Organ. And we thought that this was an opportune time where we could discuss those developments and try and understand where Ireland fits in, what part of the tapestry is Ireland um, uh, in and where might we be headed in the years to come. Amongst the uh, things that have happened since the 24th of February, an extraordinary 180 degree change in German security and defence policy, Finland and Sweden decisions to join NATO and last week, I'm sure you saw the decision of the Danish people in a referendum to opt back into the common foreign and security policy that Denmark got an opt out from at the Maastricht Treaty 30 years uh, ago. I think we're also probably seeing a, um, a sort of slight change in the center of gravity, the European Union moving somewhat to the east. The uh, countries like Poland, for example, seem to have a new credibility. After all, they warned about Russian aggression over a long period of time, and I think they're being taken more seriously, to say the least. So there are really deep and substantial questions that we're here to consider. Uh, on Europe, um, I was thinking over the weekend in particular of Christopher Hill and the old capability expectations gap. There is a sense that Europe has stepped up in the immediate context of the Russian assault on Ukraine, but there are still really deep and abiding challenges attached to the security framework uh, in Europe. The issue of the veto, for example, look at the obstruction of Hungary and some other states to the Russian oil embargo, the decision, for example, last week about Patriarch Kirill, that he should not be uh, on the sanctions list. Um, really important questions about the future of the transatlantic relationship, as well as the potential for further expansion of the EU. Will Ukraine be offered a membership perspective? If so, what form might that perspective take? And these questions apply equally to the Western Balkans. There's a sense of unfinished business uh, in that part of the continent. And for Ireland, of course, there are really profound questions being raised. Um, where other neutral states are either making the decision to apply for NATO membership or to deepen their commitment to European uh, security and defence policy. Uh, needless to say, that's going to have an impact here. So I really welcome this opportunity to have this conversation. And it's a great pleasure to welcome our speakers. I'll introduce them uh, briefly to you. Um, Professor Henry Farrell joins us from John Hopkins University in the United States. Uh, Henry has a background in international political economy, and his recent work has been about uh, the nexus between politics and technology, and what that means for uh, society and for international affairs. We're delighted that Henry could join us, and he's going to open our proceedings in just a few minutes. Uh, our second speaker, Professor Ben Tonra, equally needs little introduction. Uh, professor at University College Dublin, somebody who has written very extensively about European foreign and security policy and Irish foreign policy over the years. Welcome, Ben, and thank you for joining us. Thirdly, Professor Bridget Laffin, uh, recently retired from the uh, European University Institute in Florence, where she was director of the Robert Schumann Center for the last decade. Uh, previously, vice president of UCD and professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at UCD, and somebody who, again, has written very extensively about Ireland's relationship with the European Union, as well as the broader um, 
tapestry of European integration. And I'm particularly interested in the way Bridget has been fleshing out her ideas about collective power Europe, which she's going to talk about uh, this morning. And last but not least, we also welcome David O'Sullivan, the Executive Director of the Institute for European and International Affairs in Dublin. You will know that David has had a very distinguished career as a diplomat, rising to the very top of the European Commission as Secretary General, and then serving as the EU Ambassador to Washington. And I think that transatlantic perspective on uh, developments will also be very welcome and very crucial. So those are our speakers. Uh, we've got two hours. Uh, we're going to take about an hour where each of the panelists will speak for seven to ten minutes. And after that, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So I look forward to a very healthy and stimulating conversation. And I'd like to welcome Henry now as our first speaker, uh, Henry Farrell. Thanks, Henry. Okay, so thank you very much. I can't say how happy I am to be back in Ireland uh, giving this talk and with such a wonderful group of people. And I have to in particular single out Bridget here as somebody who on sort of a grew me as an undergraduate. And uh, you know, I'm not quite sure uh, whether she wants to be blamed for the results, <laughs> but it is just an extraordinary feeling to be on a panel with her uh, a couple of decades later. So what we've been asked to talk about is Ireland's place in the changing security landscape. And I want to give you a somewhat different account of that than perhaps I think the other speakers are going to do, because I want to focus on a different understanding of what that landscape is. As John said, you know, so when we talk about Ireland's situation at the moment, we, uh, we focus uh, immediately and not, uh, not, you know, sort of, uh, not wrongly on the physical situation of Ireland, the uh, physical security questions that come from being an Ireland I island on the western seaboard of, the, of, of Europe. And in particular, we start to think about the questions of what happens after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Do we want to start thinking about Irish neutrality in a different way going forward? These are incredibly important questions. They are also questions that I am completely unqualified to talk about, especially in comparison to the other people who are on the panel. So what I want to do is to talk about a different understanding of what the security landscape is, a different understanding uh, coming from that of what some of the challenges that Ireland has to face are, because very clearly there is a debate which is beginning around physical security, around the defense forces and their underfunding, around neutrality. But I think that there is another debate that we need to start engaging in, which focuses on a quite different understanding of the landscape uh, that Ireland uh, faces and a quite different understanding of the threats and challenges that Ireland has to face. So if we're to look at this landscape, I think it's useful to go quickly through a few of the important landmarks on it. So first of all, here, this is Amazon Web Services, uh, South Dublin uh, server farm. This here is Intel's uh, fab in Leakslip County Kildare for producing semiconductors. And this is the International Financial Services Center uh, in the heart of Dublin. Now, when we think about these, we tend to think about these in purely economic terms. We tend to think of, of these as part of Ireland's growth story, its economic growth story over the last few decades, how it is that Ireland as a small economy has been able to embrace globalization and has been able to do extremely well from it. But in fact, uh, th this is all true, but equally, these are parts of globalized networks. Uh, if you think about the uh, way, for example, that the uh, that, that, that the, the um, uh, Amazon Web Services is an essential part of the internet. If you look at the uh, leak, slip, uh, uh, leak slip manufacturing plant, that is part of global semiconductor uh, supply chains and value chains. If you look at the IFSC, that is part of this network of global financial flows. All of these networks are part of the globalized economy that we live in. And this is the important uh, point that I want to make. This globalized economy and the networks that it forms, these are their own security landscape. We have thought about these for decades in terms of pure of their economic benefits, they are increasingly being seen as security questions, security problems, and security risks. 
And to the extent that is happening, this has important consequences for Ireland going forward because Ireland is quite exposed on many of these uh, dimensions and Ireland's position is going to have to change, I think, in order to reflect the changes that is happening in this landscape as issues and questions that we have thought about exclusively in economic terms turn out to, in fact, have a crucial security dimension too. So this is, in a sense, not the world we were promised. And this is one of the reasons why I think Ireland and other countries have had some difficulty in starting to think strategically about this new world that is emerging, because it doesn't fit into the concepts that we have uh, been using up to date. And here, the American uh, writer Thomas Friedman, I think, has been particularly uh, persuasive in creating a kind of a vision of the world which really dominated our understanding for 30 odd years. So back in 1999, he writes this article, which uh, then feeds into his book, The World is Flat, which of course has huge influence, not just on business, but on policymakers, where he says that in the wake of the Cold War, a decade after the Cold War is over, we are moving from the world of the uh, wall to the world of the web. And what he means to say by that is that we are moving from a world in which we are divided by these barriers, such as the Berlin Wall, where we're looking at each other with suspicion and fear and confrontation. With all of the geopolitics that that entails, we, are, we have moved from that world into a world of the web, by which you mean not just the World Wide Web and the internet, but also financial networks, also uh, economic and production networks, all of these networks which are uniting the world economy into a coherent whole. And his argument is that this is a fundamental replacement for geopolitics. We do not have to worry anymore about war and coercion in this new world, because this new world is going to be based upon a market logic rather than a political logic. Now, this is a beautiful vision. It's also completely wrong. And this is the thing that has emerged and sort of emphatically over the last few years. Here, this is a bunch of different uh, newspaper headlines which demonstrate the ways in which, for example, the United States has been able to use these networks in uh, semiconductors, in, uh, in uh, financial networks such as the dollar clearing system, in order to uh, impose coercion globally, and the ways in which other powers are trying to push back. China in particular, also the European Union in some complicated ways, has reacted especially to the Trump administration to try and uh, begin to insulate itself against these new forms of power. So effectively, this web that Thomas Friedman was talking about, which he saw as creating peace, in some ways it resembles much more if you are a fantasy nerd like I am, the web from Shilab in The Lord of the Rings. You know, it is not a web that unites and weaves the world together. It is sometimes a web, it does that sometimes, but equally sometimes it is a web that tangles, that constricts, and is used to dominate and is used as a tool of power. And that is a new world, a new security landscape that Ireland really needs to face up to because many of the things that turn out to be extraordinary advantages for Ireland in the world of openness, in the world of globalization, create increased risks, create, create increased vulnerabilities as these networks become more and more viewed in security terms. So if we think, for example, about the kinds of data centers that Ireland has that have been very successful in attracting, uh, places like Facebook, Microsoft, all of these have host their data centers on Irish soil. The quote at the top is from, uh, is from uh, Brad Smith, the uh, president of Microsoft, who likes to say that Ireland is to data as Switzerland is to money. That is intended as a compliment. Uh, there are obviously some uh, disagreements about how Switzerland actually uh, regulates its banks, which are perhaps travel to criticisms of some of Ireland's practices as well. But nonetheless, Ireland has done extremely well by bridging between Europe and the United States by providing a place where US firms can host data centers that effectively uh, cater to the European market. That is being threatened by a, a continued and increasing security disagreements. Most obviously, the, uh, the divergence between the EU and the US over surveillance, which has led to the uh, collapse of two agreements over privacy. They have come up with a third of whether or not that a third one is going to work. Nobody knows because it has not been revealed in public yet. Uh, so this is uh, something that can have long-term substantial consequences for Ireland's ability to continue to do this. And when you add this to other threats that are emerging, such as uh, cybersecurity threats, uh, Ireland's uh, spending on cybersecurity is pitiful compared to the size of the threat and compared to the juiciness of the targets that are on Irish soil, these are data centers, 
as we see the Russia and Ukraine conflict, not simply being a physical conflict, but also being this quiet war which is waged with cyber weapons, we don't see, I don't think, Ireland paying sufficient uh, attention to the strategic dimensions and to the vulnerabilities that are being created. And finally, we see a world in which data localization is becoming more and more a mantra as countries try to limit their vulnerabilities by keeping as much of their data within their borders as possible. Again, that poses a, a problem and challenges to countries such as Ireland, which seek to act as intermediaries in this um, sort of global open network. Uh, similarly, when it comes to things like semiconductor manufacturing. So uh, TSMC, uh, this is a, uh, the biggest uh, semiconductor manufacturer in the world, which is in Taiwan, is especially exposed to these kinds of problems. Uh, as we see, uh, it's uh, caught in an awkward position between the United States and China, each of which is trying to grab it. The world is um, sort of bifurcating into two different um, sort of technological complexes, one centered around the United States, one centered around China. The quote at the top is from Morris Chang, TSMC's founder, who was asked a few months ago about Friedman's world as flat hypothesis, and his response was, well, Tom, Tom the world is not flat anymore. So we are in a world in which so instead of having this flat marketplace, we are seeing bifurcation of technologies, and this is going to have consequences for Ireland as well. Uh, presumably, if Ireland is faced with the choice of uh, being closer to China or the US, it would prefer the United States, but that is going to come with a lot of added uh, questions. As the US, I'm sorry, it is pushing for a French shoring model, which I'm sorry, would have uh, various forms of production located on allied territory, but with a lot of expectations about information sharing and security cooperation going together with that. So one interesting question that I think uh, we ask about Irish neutrality is, to what extent does neutrality, um, Irish neutrality travel into these questions about technology? And if technology is becoming increasingly a realm of security, uh, does this then mean that um, sort of Irish military neutrality becomes less and less relevant to the places where Ireland is actually um, sort of engaged in real and complex security questions? Finally, we look at uh, financial services. And here we all know the debates and the arguments that are happening around Ireland's and sort of taxation regime. But I think what is less appreciated is that as we move into a world of greater security risks, greater security questions, further questions are going to be asked about this. If we look at the special purpose vehicles which are used by businesses to uh, host their profits and sort of uh, in Ireland's uh, low taxation regime, these uh, vehicles by design are extremely non-transparent. That becomes a problematic security risk when they're used by Russian oligarchs or others to conceal the sources of their wealth. The extent to which this uh, non-transparency can be uh, retained is open. And more subtly, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the relocation of, uh, of profits to Ireland depends upon creative accounting with respect to intellectual property, <laughs> where intellectual property is located. As intellectual property is becoming weaponized by various governments, including especially the United States, as a means of excluding Chinese firms like Huawei from access to uh, semiconductors, which are being built using uh, US IP, the, I think the, the uh, scope for these um, clever corporate strategies is going to become greatly limited, again, posing some serious questions for Ireland's model going forward. So, I have um, sort of a variety of different suggestions here, which I'm going to pass over quickly. The bottom line is that Ireland has for a long time, it has based its economic strategy on an assumption that we are living in an open globalized world where globalized networks have no great security assumptions or no, no great security consequences. That assumption is turning out to be wrong. And to the extent that it is wrong, Ireland is going to have to not just deal with the traditional military security questions, it is also going to have to confront the ways in which its economic growth model and security, uh, security model are increasingly going to become intertangled with each other and to some degree indistinguishable from each other. That's going to pose a huge set of questions. I uh, worry sometimes that Ireland, uses, I think that the uh, capacity for uh, thinking through deep foreign policy questions um, sort of in Ireland is not as well developed as it might be, that there is less contact between uh, academia, think tanks, um, sort of people in the Department of Foreign Affairs and elsewhere than there might be. And I really worry uh, that uh, 
uh, that Ireland needs to have some very substantial rethinking very quickly across a wide variety of dimensions in order to understand how best to confront this new shifting security landscape, which is really, I think, going to have some very, very consequential, uh, very consequential effects over the coming decade. Thank you. And I should also say this is uh, this is all based on work with a co-author uh, who uh, takes should take no responsibility for any mistakes or idiocies I have uttered, but should get all the credit for anything I said that is good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Henry. Uh, lots of food for thought there. We will come back to these questions uh, in just a little while. Uh, I should have said at the outset uh, an apology from the Finnish ambassador to Ireland. Um, we were really looking forward to having her on the panel. Finland is, of course, hugely interesting to us in the current context, but uh, at the last minute, she had to go to Helsinki with our Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence. And in, in a sense, that proves the point about the fluidity of the current situation and how relationships are changing and building and so forth. So she specifically asked me to give her apologies and very happy to do that. Bridget. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and I think we're addressing really interesting and important topics at a time of extraordinary contingency and uncertainty and there's an awful lot we simply don't know and so how we manage uncertainty and contingency both in Ireland but also in Europe uh, is really important in the time ahead. It's a pleasure to be with my colleagues on this panel and I have to claim two undergraduates on the on, on the panel, not one. <laughs> that will, uh, life passes, uh, life passes so quickly. So what I focus on is not Ireland, but on, uh, on Europe's changing security landscape. Uh, and as John said, the 24th of February was an enormous shock, but it shouldn't have been. Illusions were shattered. Uh, those illusions, in my view, should never have been there in the first place because Putin was acting in plain sight with Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea, Syria. So it was very obvious what the Putin playbook was. And yet there was a deliberate, in my view, um, complacency and a sense that it was too comfortable. This energy was cheap, it was near, and therefore one wouldn't want to look at the downsides. But also, we ignored the significant impact that Putin had on democratic politics in the rest of the continent. He funded the radical right, he attacked uh, European states in terms of cyber attacks. And so we have to ask ourselves, what was it about Ukraine that simply tilted us into another world? And I would argue that it was the fact that a very large army amassed on a border and crossed. And it wasn't, even right up to the very end, the sense was that this would be a limited invasion, maybe the eastern half of Ukraine, but he went for the whole thing. And essentially what he wanted to do was alter the post, the Cold War security order. He effectively wanted to have, <laughs> to create vassal states uh, around, uh, around Russia and alter and unsettle NATO and unsettle the security of all of the continent. I don't think this was ever just uh, about Ukraine. It was about much, much more. But of course, it wasn't just an attack on Europe's security order. It was also a very serious attack on a rules-based international order. And the one thing I would say about Ireland in relation to that, that the countries in the world that are most dependent on rule-based international orders are the small. We don't have the might. So we're small and we need those structures. And those structures are now, where those structures were under extraordinary pressure anyway, and it's now just much, uh, much, much more acute. So far, the EU's collective response has been, I think, more than anyone would have expected. Although we can see from the latest, the sixth round of sanctions, we see the hungry flag being played. We've also seen a significant change in member states and a reinforcement of NATO and the transatlantic alliance and NATO-EU cooperation. And I think there's a major issue, not just for Ireland here, but also for the EU. And that is, what price will Washington want for the reinvigoration of the transatlantic alliance? 
what will that what will the payback be because there is always for europe cooperation with the us but also competition with the us and so what is the in this world of great power competition which henry uh, spoke about where where does the relationship between U us hegemony and European needs lie. And I think that's a very big and uncertain debate. And of course, the future of the transatlantic alliance is entirely contingent on who uh, on who, who becomes president of the United States in the future, because Europe may find itself um, to take much more responsibility for its security and defense than it is prepared for or would want. So again, I think there's, uh, I would also say that all of the issues on the table today energy security, defense, the vulnerabilities, they were, they've been there, they've been on the table, they've been on the agenda for a very long time. But I think what's happened now is the choices are sharper, they're more compelling, and they're much more urgent. And that's where the shift is. Europe was talking about energy vulnerability for a very long time, and there was real concern when the Germans gave the uh, the permit for the construction of Nord Stream in German, in German uh, in the ger German waters, as late as January 80. This is how you know. This is how blind and will it willfully blind we were. So for Europe, it goes back to that old question, and I think Joseph Borrell, uh, in December 19, when he met the foreign ministers of the EU for the first time, he said Europe had a choice. It either could be a player in the world of great power competition, and that. Um, that, that weaponization of interdependence, which Henry and his colleague has done such wonderful work on, or a plaything. In other words, Europe has choices and very serious choices to make. And we know what the Achilles heels are, they're in security and they're in energy. But therefore, the question I've been puzzling for, for the last couple of months is, what kind of power does the EU have to become. It won't ever be a great power in the sense of a single source of political authority. It will never be a scaled up version of a nation state. It will never be a large, uh, a large power with a lot of coherence. So what does, what does the EU need to do? And if one thinks of the way in which, and John mentioned Chris Hill and the expectation capabilities gap, which was that the, we always have big expectations of the EU and then the capability problem of delivery. But there's also, I think, in the literature, and I'm not an IR specialist, that's not, uh, that's not my training, but I'm, <clears throat> when I look at the literature on the EU as a foreign policy actor or the EU as a global actor, then I'm struck by there's a literature on the EU in terms of market power, the, the economy, the Brussels effect, the way in which the EU can uh, externalize regulation, but also the magnetic attraction of that very large and wealthy and prosperous single market, so market power. And then in the foreign policy literature, there's been normative power Europe from the beginning of the 2000s in manners, where effectively the argument was that the EU had soft power because of its values and could impose new practices and frames on international politics. And I just don't think that's enough for the world we live in today, that it's neither reflects the world we live in today, nor will equip Europe to be a player as opposed to a plaything. And so I think when we, I would argue that in looking at the EU through the decade of crisis, but particularly from Brexit on, what we see is a, a more capable EU emerging, and that more capable EU concentrates on the power too, rather than command power. And that's the power to establish collective goals, to generate institutional capacity, policy capacity, and to translate that into action. And that remains a challenge for the EU. The EU is always good at talking the talk and less good at walking the walk and taking the end. Um, but there is, there is certainly a desire, but also evidence that the EU understands that the world, uh, we live in a world of great, of hard geopolitics and great power competition. The uh, strategic compass that 
Ben perhaps will talk about, is an attempt at least to analyze Europe's strategic threats. Uh, and But again, uh, in terms of actual actions, uh, it's, it, the document is, is not so strong. But why do I argue that we've seen a shift in the EU since Brexit? So I would say that the EU's response to Brexit, the pandemic and Ukraine, has been qualitatively different to its response to the Eurozone and to the migration crisis. And what I argue is that there is a, there's practices are developing within the EU that are more responsive, more agile, and more committed to a politics of scale. Now, the EU is very uneven in that, but at least there is evidence that the EU is responding with greater speed uh, and is prepared to look at the toolkit. So what are the ingredients of this, uh, what are the ingredients of this emerging because whenever I use uh, collective power, I always have a question mark after it because I think the question mark is merited. Uh, what are the ingredients of this? I would say, firstly, where does the leadership come from and how are the challenges framed? And the EU will always have distributed <laughs> leadership. There is no Putin available, luckily, to the rest of the continent. So, where does the leadership come from? And here it's very much dependent on the whole of the parts, because I think we sometimes as analysts of the EU, we're much too Brussels centric, but the EU is actually the central institutions, uh, but also the member states, the capitals. So framing, can the EU come to a sufficiently united frame of what the challenges are and what should be done? And unity is very important, but it's not unity as in unanimity, but rather it's a sufficient consensus to allow the system to respond. And uh, as we see on all three of those crises, there was that unity was forged, was maintained. It required different actors. There were different actors involved, but there was a common view of what needed to be done. Now we see on the sixth, sanctions package, we see the hungry issue uh, coming. The second element of this collective power is what I would call the, the, the leverage of the EU's institutional capacity and the co-creation of strategy. So in other words, we shouldn't pay undue attention to competition between the Council, the Commission and all that, you know, a lot of work on policy making in the EU, but rather how they co-create and work together. And that involves the European Council as the command centre, it involves the Sherpas in the capitals, and the, trans the constant transnational links we see across the system now. But also the role of, and this is where the Lisbon Treaty uh, comes in, it strengthened the supranational institutions, and I would regard, for example, uh, the president of the European Council as a supranational actor, uh, or at least a collective actor. Uh, so what, <laughs> what capacity and how can the knowledge and institutions like the Commission be leveraged? And then, of course, uh, and I see, Francis, how the European Parliament can be kept on board to legitimise what's happening. And then finally, agility. Uh, the, the reflex in the EU is it looks at the existing toolkit. It looks to where it can use, and there was a very interesting use of the peace facility. The peace facility was suddenly able to send and fund lethal weapons in a third country. Now, if anyone had said in January that would happen, no one would have thought it possible, but it did happen. So the EU will always try to work with what the fabric of the system is already, because it loves precedent. If you have a precedent, and you have something available, you use it. But then it, it also is very open to new uh, instruments. It will look for, and, and this was particularly true in the pandemic with the common, uh, with the common borrowing. So I would end by saying that this collective Europe that is 
striving <laughs> to strengthen uh, is a Europe not of unity and diversity, which is in which is intrinsic to what the EU is. But I always use the great draggy phrase now: the Europe of whatever it takes. Uh, in other words, what needs to be done to make sure that Europe in a sense, doesn't globally go down the tubes with considerable style. Uh, and so the, I won't and don't have to tell this audience what the challenges are, what the limitations are, what the problems are. But Europe can't be and won't be a great power, ACA, the United States and China, and therefore it has to forge a power capacity that is different, but also has capability. And when I look at the EU today and the EU of 2009, we're dealing with a very different animal. It's much more political, it is more capable, and most of the time it's more united. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, I, it was about 40 minutes before we mentioned the B word, Brexit. I think that's progress. If I had it exist <laughs> a year ago, two years ago, it would be a very different thing. Um, delighted now to welcome Ben and his contribution on Europe and Ireland. Thanks very much, Don. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, as a uh, brilliant second undergraduate, I'm delighted, delighted to offer uh, my own sort of response to, to Henry's fascinating presentation. Um, and to come at this from sort of an IR security frame and, and also perhaps to extrapolate uh, from some of his comments relating to, to specifically to Irish foreign policy. Um, I mean, I certainly concur with, 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 with Henry's diagnosis. Um, I'm not entirely sure that the definition of security has changed. I think many in the IR security community, you know, would look at, you know, the Wall Street crash, the dot-com bubble, the euro crisis, from a security perspective and see them as having impinged on European and global security in their respective uh, epochs. But we are certainly uh, more conscious of the security implications of things that were not traditionally within the security realms or seem to be within the security realm. Um, and the interrelationships uh, with security that Henry's identified in terms of economics, trade, IT, migration, financial systems, et cetera, they certainly have a much greater public salience than they did before, um, uh, even if that's not uh, not been reflected in, in, in headlines. I would have a note of caution here, though, um, because as with other sort of redefinitions, understandings, or expansions of the concept of security, um, and I would have worked, for example, with the notion of human security uh, at, at certain points, there is that danger that if everything's a security issue, nothing becomes a security issue because it becomes impossible to prioritize and to identify what needs to be done first if everything has security implications. Um, the second caveat I, I would have with this, this expanded um, um, understanding definition or how you, how you take it in terms of security um, is that for me, it's, it's, it's the cyber and the tech that really has become the game changer. Um, it's not so much to my mind that we're returning to 19th century geopolitics. Um, a, la, a la Mearsheimer or a la others. Um, for me, it's the fact that the underbelly of globalization and interdependence have been revealed in a way that perhaps we didn't fully appreciate before. Um, again, and, and I don't know whether this is a function of us both being undergraduates of Bridget or not, but I'm also a fan of fantasy fiction, um, and his reference to Shelob's lair was, was immediately resonant. But that, but that notion of the underside of globalization, the vulnerabilities that interdependence we knew always assumed, but weren't actually made clear or weren't made sort of practically relevant. I think that really is a, is a game changer. Um, and I think Henry was also right to identify that, that Ireland has been the poster child of globalization, has reaped huge rewards from globalization. Ireland has sold itself as the home of globalization and has pursued across ne a number of different public policy realms this this making of Ireland as a center for international commerce, um, um, a hub, if you like, in terms of IT, in terms of social media, in terms of, in terms of all of those new uh, economic and, and, and industrial realms. Um, but within that, there's a, something of a contradiction. Now, I know it's something of a truism to say that, you know, small states have to rely on the, on the, on the, on the force of law because they can't rely on the law of force. So small states have to be dedicated 
to multilateralism, the international system, uh, and, and legal certainty. But here's a provocation, and here's something of an extrapolation from what Henry was saying. Is it a case, perhaps, that just as Ireland has been a free rider in terms of defense, Ireland has also been something of a free rider in terms of multilateralism? Ireland has talked to talk about multilateralism and commitment to the multilateral system, but has it walked the walk? Because as Henry has identified, if you look at a number of key areas, such as taxation, such as IT, such as migration, um, Ireland plays a very interesting game in terms of talking about multilateral commitment, but playing the margins, playing the middle off the center, looking for that exceptional deal, trying to define Ireland in a way that, that escapes the rigors of you know, a new OECD tax agreement or new um, uh, regulations on social media companies headquartered in Ireland. So it's, it's a question as to whether or not free riding is actually a pattern in terms of Irish foreign security and defense policy. Um, you know, you remember the, the IFSC being described as the Wild West of European finance. Uh, we know, as I say again, you know, the issues in terms of Ireland's perceived to be, you know, we can talk to the Data Protection Commission about this, Ireland's perceived to be weakness in terms of its regulation of the big, of the big media companies. And of course, we have the issues, obviously, of, of, of taxation. Um, but Henry went on then to identify sort of you know, where the international system may be going and some of the challenges uh, that, that, that we face as a result of that. There are a couple that I'd, I'd add, to, add into the mix or maybe expand on. First of all, Henry identifies upcoming and, and current transatlantic battles um, in which Ireland will have to, to box clever. Um, and it has to box clever because oddly, I would see Ireland as trying to force sort of a, 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 an Anglo-Saxon socioeconomic peg into a Rhineland political model. And there's a curious contradiction there again in terms of Ireland's commitment to multilateralism as opposed to what Ireland practices in terms of its international commitments and, and, and international contributions. And the other challenge is that transatlantic piece that, that Bridget has mentioned. You know, we have been absolutely blessed to have a confirmed Atlanta system in the White House. It might not have been thus. Had it not been thus, what might we be facing today? Might it not be thus in 31, 32 months time? And there, in terms of the tensions that Henry's identified, sort of the polite tensions in terms of you know, China, in terms of IT regulation, et cetera, those polite transatlantic tensions could become very brutal very quickly. And Ireland will not be in a position to carve out a via media in that kind of acute transatlantic rift nor will it be able to sell itself as a bridge. So the question that Irish policymakers were going to have to ask themselves is, you know, how tightly does Ireland cleave to what Bridget and other writings has described as, you know, the anchorage of its European commitment? And how will that fare with, as I say, the kind of exceptionalism, the kind of, you know, picking at the margins that Ireland has done across a number of salient public policy issues? Um, <laughs> And this brings me back to my own bailiwick of, of hard security, defense, and, and military capacity as a conclusion. You know, territorial defense, which now encompasses the cyber, because you are, you are defending territory when you're defending yourself through cyber, that really has come back front and center in European defense planning. Ireland, as I said earlier, has been a free rider in terms of territorial defense. And as I say, as something for provocation, perhaps Ireland has also been a free rider in other aspects of security that Henry identified earlier. But nobody's going to beat down Ireland's door demanding that Ireland join a common defence, or even that Ireland commit to deeper coordination and commitment on defence. Every member state has its idiosyncrasies, every member state has its lacunae. Ireland and defence and security is well understood, well recognised, as I say, nobody's going to insist that we do anything in terms of security defense. But what are the consequences if Ireland continues to marginalize itself in terms of defense and security? And moreover, if that marginalization is extended or continues in other areas of common policy, like taxation, mm -hmm. like migration, like financial and, and, and social media regulation. 
And I can't not but reference the, you know, the, the, the Irish Times piece yesterday from, from Naomi O'Leary talking to, to uh, uh, Mary Lou MacDonald, the leader of Sinn Féin, about her foreign policy prioritised. And as we said, this was off the cuff. It was a doorstep. You know, it wasn't a considered response. But her immediate sort of gut instinct was to talk about reasserting neutrality and Palestine. Now, if you're going to reassert on neutrality, what does that mean? Because clearly, if the status quo is unacceptable and is deemed to undermine Irish neutrality, in reasserting Irish neutrality, you're not just doing that at, at a rhetorical level. What is Ireland going to pull out of? What are we going to withdraw from? What opt-outs are we going to demand? And again, if you frame that within this larger argument, and it is just an argument about Ireland's free riding in other areas of this new security landscape, what are the implications of that marginalization for Ireland in Europe? What might that look like in five years' time under a new administration led by Mary Lou MacDonald? Is it a prospect? Is it a conceivable idea that Ireland might join the Ukraine and the UK in one of President Macron's outside circles of Europe? And what might that spell and what might that then portend for Ireland's not just commitment in Europe, but also its own security? Thank you very much. And our final speaker, uh, David O'Sullivan, uh, really nobody is better placed to talk about the transatlantic relationship in particular uh, than David. Thanks very much. David. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the previous speakers. Um, uh, nearly everything has been said, but not yet by everyone. Uh, so let me try and uh, add a bit. It, it, it's, it's a large subject, and I'm reminded of the apocryphal story of President de Gaulle looking out uh, the, the window of the Elysee Palace in 1968 at the student protests and someone held up a placard saying, more au con, death to, dead to idiots. And he reportedly turned to his assistant and said, of un vast projet. Un vast <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, this, is, this is frankly a very difficult subject to kind of get your head around, right? Uh, because uh, as Ben rightly said, I mean, I, I thank Henry very much for his excellent presentation. I, I agree with nearly everything he said, but there is this risk that by saying security is everything, <laughs> security is nothing, and how do you how do you kind of divide it up into, as the Americans like to say, bite-sized chunks that you can actually have a policy and implement it and decide, well, this is actually what we need to do. Um, I do agree with uh, Henry's basic premise that uh, this is a, security is a whole of government issue. Uh, it, it cannot be limited to, to military uh, or even to cyber. Uh, it is economic. By the way, it's climate change. Uh, I think I'm the first person to mention climate yeah. change. Uh, but the Pentagon has had for the last 10 years climate change as the single greatest threat to US national security. Uh, not always acted upon by US administrations and still less by the Congress. But that is, a, a, that is another, a, an additional reality with which we have to grow, grapple. So I also agree with Henry. I, remarkable American understatement that maybe the debate about security and foreign policy and debate and defense in Ireland is somewhat underdeveloped. Uh, I would say pretty non-existent, to be honest with you, and I, I give full credit to Ben, who's been plowing this, this field uh, on his own for a long time. I'm delighted, John, that you've taken the initiative to, to organize this event. I think we really need, before we can even have a discussion in Ireland about many of these issues, we just have to even agree on a language. Uh, because we're so unfamiliar with the kind of concepts that are regularly discussed, frankly, in just about any other country in the world except here, uh, national security, uh, defense, uh, 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 security interests, the link between security and defense. And it really is a whole of government issue. It, it covers indeed uh, the economic, uh, the, the, the cyber, the technological issues. But it also, and here I agree with, with Ben, uh, Territorial defense is back. I think Boris Johnson, not someone I cite very often, uh, famously said a few months before the Ukraine invasion, well, you know, it's no longer about tanks and, and artillery. It's all about uh, cyber and so on. Well, I'm afraid the Ukraine conflict has unfortunately shown us that it can still be about tanks and artillery and traditional fighting. And that's something we have to give thought to here, uh, because it's very easy for people to say, well, actually, we don't need to worry about these defense issues because it's all about cyber. Uh, the fact is, as, as Ben said, territorial defense is back in Europe. 
It's a major preoccupation of all our, all our member states. Uh, and we have some major challenges here on that issue. It's not, I'm not gonna elaborate further on that now, but I think it's, it's something we, we cannot opt out by saying, well, security is so broadly defined, it's pretty irrelevant what you do on territorial defense. The ability of any country to provide a credible deterrent to anyone who is tempted to invade that remains a, a, a critical factor in any definition of national security. But um, to come back to the, the main thesis of, of Henry's presentation, that, that globalization is dead, um, I don't fully agree. I mean, I think uh, what we are witnessing is the, the regionalization rather than the end of globalization. And I think in this context, there are going to be three main blocks. Well, there'll be four main blocks, I would say. You will have the US, China, and the EU. The fourth block I would broadly describe as the Global South, which is not a term I like very much, but it, it encapsulates the, the, the non-aligned countries of, of the rest. Uh, Asia poses a slight problem in that definition because you can arguably say that uh, Japan, South Korea, ASEAN are certainly not the Global South in the sense that they're, they're highly developed. Uh, and they also, of course, have a particular regional problem in relation in relation to China. So maybe there's five blocks. But the, the basic point is, I think we're witnessing the regionalization. And I think what was missing, respectfully, from Henry's presentation was that the whole point for Ireland is membership of the EU. That's what makes the big difference. If, if, if that presentation were about an Ireland which was outside the EU, I would be much more worried. I'm much less worried because we're within the EU, which means we have a solid anchoring in one of those regional blocks. And I think that is how this is going to develop. Uh, though this then takes me to, uh, to Ben's point, and I'll come to that at the end, about how embedded we are in that European block and how we see its development uh, uh, going forward. And in this regard, the tectonic plates that are shifting are indeed the US-China conflict. I mean, today it's all about Ukraine, and it should be, uh, and Russia is a threat. But never forget, Bridget was somewhat critical of the EU position on Russia, and I don't disagree with her. But let's not forget that for the Americans, Russia wasn't an issue. When I was in America in, in 2014, 2015, 2016, if you read the American National Security Report, Russia was a declining regional power, not a concern to America. China was the threat. They never saw uh, Putin as a serious military or strategic threat. They always thought Russia was on its way out. It was just a matter of time before the economy ran down uh, and it became increasingly irrelevant. Mr. Putin has at least challenged that assumption. Uh, I think he has probably hastened the decline of his own country, but that's another issue. Uh, so Russia for the moment is back. But to be very frank, and I think we need to understand this, for the American friends, this is a distraction from the main game, which is China. They are being very supportive, uh, a remarkable job done by the Biden administration in, in mobilizing uh, uh, the reaction to uh, the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine. But the fact is they are still thinking China. And increasingly now, what we're going to hear is the global theater, a theater that spreads from Ukraine to Taiwan. And this has huge implications for Europe, because of course, now we are concerned about Russia, but with visiting China, we've always been less anxious to be forced to take sides in, in a binary debate, US or China. And I think this is going to be the big challenge of the next 10 years. Of course, we're gonna to have to sort out the relationship with Russia uh, and, and, and how we deal with Russia. But the fact is the pressure is going to grow uh, for us to take sides in the US China debate. And there is where the accentuation of the regionalization is going to happen, because what is China's, what are China's takeaways from uh, what is happening in Ukraine? Firstly, uh, that if you are going to use military force, you need to use it massively and successfully, and the Russians, which the Russians have clearly failed to do. But secondly, that you need to be able to insulate yourself from sanctions it, it, which will be taken in response to anything that you do. And the focus of Chinese policy is going to be increasingly to decouple from the West. I used to say to the Americans that they were making a mistake by thinking that they should want to decouple China. The fear I have is that China will actually want to decouple more quickly 
from us than we will decouple from China. And this is going to have huge consequences for the global supply chains and the interconnectedness that uh, Henry has been talking about. The other point, of course, in this is the instability in the United States, which many have mentioned. And this, I think, is a major concern for Europe, and I, I agree with Ben in this regard. Um, we are so fortunate with the president we have in the White House, and not just the president we have in the White House, but the remarkable team around him. It's probably the most Europe knowledgeable team I've ever seen assembled in the US administration. From the staff in the, in the White House, to Tony Blinken, Wendy Sherman, and, and Victoria Newland in the, in, the, in the State Department, right across the whole spectrum of American policy making. We have people who know about Europe, care about Europe, care about the transatlantic relationship. There are still tensions. We have not solved all the trade problems. We haven't solved the, 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 the data privacy issue. So there are, there are the ongoing tensions that are always there in the transatlantic relationship. But basically, the transatlantic alliance is back on track. But only as long as we continue to have someone in the White House and supporting Congress for that. And the risk is high that that will change in 2024. Indeed, it will probably change, begin to change, uh, with the midterm elections where the predictions are that quite likely uh, this, the, the Democrats will lose the House, may even lose the Senate which is going to create a very difficult second term, second two years for, for, for Joe Biden. But the more important issue, of course, the, the presidential election in 2024. What happens if we have a return to a, a Trump like either Trump himself or a Trump like president? This is going to pose a huge challenge for Europe. And there I agree with the British definition. We only have a short time in which to reinvent ourselves as some form of, of international power, which is not which has no international, which has no precedent. We're not going to be a sovereign state, we're not a nation state, we're not going to be a fully federalized state, but if we want to be a global actor that is credible and that helps shape the world around us and not just be the, not just be the, the, the victim of a world shaped by others, then we have to find new ways of acting together. And, and that, is, that is going to be very challenging for all the reasons that those of us who work on Europe know, know so well. For Ireland, uh, I, I think the issue really is, as Ben described it at the end, we're going to have to make some choices. We, we have managed to straddle this bit of Boston and Berlin quite skillfully. And, and by the way, it was the right thing to do in the circumstances. It was a sensible thing to do. But I'm not sure that that option of straddling that, that divide uh, in the way that we have in the past is it, going to continue to be available to us. And in our discussions about our security, and I'd love to see us actually have a national security policy, uh, which most countries have, it would be a very interesting exercise to actually try and write down what our security interests are. And I think any analysis is going to show that ultimately our security strength is the relationship with the EU. It is the only um, support that we have against this uh, much less well-organized global order that we are heading into compared to what we have known uh, in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, where we had the strength of the international organizations. I know we're very attached to the United Nations. I'm personally very attached to the United Nations, but let's face it, as long as you have a veto of China and Russia in the Security Council, the United Nations is not going to be able to be a major actor in this new world in, in, which we're, in which we're evolving. And therefore, the relationship with the EU becomes crucial. And I think we need to look at that across the whole spectrum of policies, as Ben has said, uh, and make sure that we are a proactive member of this European Union and that we actually take the initiative. We need to move away, particularly on the security and defense side, to feel that somehow we're, we're being pressured. <coughs> Unfortunately, we're not being pressured. By the way, we are largely irrelevant to the calculus in, in the bigger picture. The issue is for ourselves. What do we want when we, as, 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 as a moral position, but also as a self-interested position? I very well remember being in the European Parliament in the mid-80s, uh, a meeting of the EPP group and Chancellor Cohen. <laughs> And the chancellor was you know, doing his usual, very studied, he was not a great rhetorical figure, but he was very measured. 
And Joe McCartan, who was then a, a, an MEP, said to him, you know, what do you think about Irish neutrality? And the Chancellor looked at him and said, he said, I don't really care. He said, you're too small. You're not relevant to the military equation. He said, but if I was Irish, I would ask myself a moral question. Why do the children of Germans have to join an army and be willing to die if there is a conflict in Europe and people in Ireland would feel that somehow they had no, they had no role to play in that? He said, that's the question I think you should be asking yourself. That was a dramatic moment. <laughs> but I think, I, think, I think it is not so much this heavy moral thing, but I do think there is a question we have to ask ourselves. Where does our future lie? in this changing world. And to me, it is deeply embedded in a European Union that functions and is capable of protecting the values we hold dearly, whether that's democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, uh, a commitment to conflict resolution or even to not provoking conflict, except when, it's, except when it becomes absolutely necessary to defend yourself. I think those are the values of Europe. And I think they are largely the values that we share. And the question is, how do we find a place for ourselves, a fully active place for ourselves in defending those values, including, if needed, uh, through some military means? And I think that's the challenge which the debate in this country is going to have to face over the next few years. It's going to be a debate in many countries. We're not the only ones who face some challenges. <laughs> but I hope that events such as this and future events will enable us to have a national conversation about this because I think it's a, a critically important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, taking up your suggestion, um, I would say that given we've about 40 minutes left, it might be better to uh, go to questions and answers immediately. So I'll take questions from the floor. Uh, as a strict disciplinarian, I have to ask you to be as concise as possible. Um, we want as many people as possible to be able to contribute. So if you have a question or a point you want to raise with one or other of the speakers, we try to be as concise as possible. And if you could state your name and institutional affiliation, if any, as well. I'm going to begin with Alan Jukes. Yes, thank you, Sean. Alan Jukes, a uh, former politician. Very um, I'm, I'm tempted to, to go back to a Sean you know, having listened to Ben and Henry particular. But on Tain up with Lodger, the Florida of Eglick, the weak have to be clever. On the other hand, I remember many years ago in a discussion like this, hearing a Dutch academic say, neutrality works as long as everybody else allows it to, which is something that we, we don't really get behind. Listening to Henry's um, analysis, it seems to me that there is a danger that we could find ourselves being the Achilles heel of European security from many points of view, cyber security, uh, finance, IT, all of those areas where in fact we have not provided ourselves uh, with the kind of security measures uh, that are known about, not to speak of those that might emerge you know, in, in, in future. And that might mean that we do come under pressure from other people uh, to, 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 to up our game in that area, so to speak. Is that not uh, a real possibility? And then I ask, um, in terms of a contribution to security, what can we possibly add to European security? Um, Cyber security is clearly one area Perhaps there is something that we could add, and I have long been a kind of a, an emotional and political uh, proponent of the idea that we should join NATO, largely for the reasons that David ended with. Uh, but what could we add to, 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 to NATO uh, apart from cyber security or perhaps a contribution to facilitating uh, intelligence gathering and security building that way. Is that the area we should look at? I think, yes, we have been too accustomed to being free riders, and I find our foreign policy uh, and our European policy has always been far too weighed to see where is a short-term advantage and not enough in terms of recognizing 
the need for the construction of the kind of, of capacity that Bridget talked about. Come on. Yeah, isn't it true that Ireland, despite the guarantees that we got uh, in looking again at the Lisbon Nice Treaty, um, that we actually are part of European defence and security structures? We've opted into PESCO on a limited basis. Uh, there are people in this room who've been part of EU military missions. So, um, just to frame that, I'm, I wonder if you would tackle that question. Yeah. To what extent are we actually really embedded in these structures? And if we do decide to go further, what would that practically mean? Well, according to the Department of Defence and the Defence Forces, we're fully, fully embedded, fully committed, and Irish foreign policy would say that we're fully committed, but we're not. I mean, it's partial, it's grudging, it's resented, and it's seen as a burden and a cost. Um, it's not seen as something that Ireland willingly contributes to. It's not something we even we talk about. Um, Someone made reference a few days ago, you know, that there was a big, big NATO conference on, on, on cybersecurity held in Dublin. Who heard about it? The Department of Defence was the host of it. Terrified anybody would hear about it. And we didn't. So that's grand. That's good. That's a, that's a result as far as the Department of Defence is concerned. Um, Partnership for Peace again. Where, where do we hear about it? Where do we, where do we know about it? Um, tweet from, the, from, from Simon Coveney outside, you know, cybersecurity headquarters. Big plaque on the door. You know, celebrating Ireland's commitment to security. Never used the word NATO. The word NATO is on the plaque that he's standing next to, but he doesn't want to mention. So, you know, we're not committed. Is the is the, is, is the short answer. Now, I, I would differ with Alan to some extent. I, I don't see NATO as a framework simply because of, as he says, I don't think we have much to contribute to them, and I don't think honestly they have much to contribute to us. And I also think that the nuclear question is a really important one that we would have to grapple with in that context. And I. For my own reasons, I think that would be a, that would be a, a, a wall, a, a wall, not a bridge. Um, but the European framework is there to be built. The European framework of a common defence. You know, you know, there are maps that we could begin to contribute to, to mould, to shape, to suit Irish interests, as opposed to jumping into jumping into NATO. And it's and it's a it's an opportunity that we're that we're missing. Um, Bridget very handily gave me a translation of the of the Irish phrase you gave about about clever. Um, I'd use a bit of Hiberno English in response. You know, possibly we've been too cute, too cute by half in terms of not just security defense, but also the other things that I mentioned where we where we've mar where we've marginalized ourselves. Um, so you know, and, and Ireland has been that vulnerability. Um, you know, these there were major European mistakes that led to the Euro crisis, but Ireland was one of those through which that crisis extrapolated, accelerated, and threatened to bring the entire system down. We were part of the problem. We were the Achilles, one of the Achilles' heels, amongst others. That nearly brought the system crashing down. Um, so, I, bottom line, we've got a lot of big, big things to think. Um, another question, please. Anybody who's got a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Colin Fulker, this is the sociology department here in Maynooth. Um, just to say, it's quite extraordinary being more than an hour in the discussion about Ireland's connection into the global multi industrial complex without the, a single mention of our most important point of connection, which is a small civilian airport in the west of this island. Um, it's quite remarkable that uh, nobody has mentioned that in the last 20 years, more than 2 million passages of American troops through Shannon Airport. It, it has been said by the last speaker that Ireland has no strategic importance. Why then is it the major conduit of American troops passing through to various theatres of war in the Middle East for the pursuit of illegal war such as the invasion of Iraq? Another thing which is really astonishing is to hear references to rule-based systems of war as if these rules existed until the 24th of February. Um, the principal country that broke those rules and broke them most spectacularly and most critically was of course the United States and its invasion of Iraq almost 20 years ago, uh, aided and abetted with a nod and a wink, precisely through the ambivalence that we're talking about by the Irish government at the time. And it's important to remember this, that the United States spends, what, whatever it is, 1,700 billion on military expenditure in the world, about 40% of that comes to the United States. The United States, over the period since the end of the Cold War, has constructed this essential empire of NATO countries on the borders of Russia, and none of this really has been mentioned. It's very important. A second point for Mike John, which is about the status of Ireland and its exceptionalism. One of the problems with the debate about Ireland's exceptionalism and its connections to these institutions of global power and might and all the rest of it is, of course, the principle of exceptionalism of Ireland is something which has been mentioned, which is that Ireland is a rogue state economically. We are now at the point where the amount of 
multinational profits that are laundered through this country is about to overtake the actual size of the economy of this country. One final thing, if I may, uh, Ben mentioned um, that uh, we haven't actually seen the underside, the underbelly of globalization. Uh, we in our country jobs in the academy may not have seen it, but the international working classes in former industrialized states know this story all too well. The 85,000 steel workers in Sheffield who lost their jobs know it too well. The 10,000 shipyard workers in Belfast who lost their jobs know it only too well. The thousands of working class Catholic women in Derry who lost their jobs as shirt makers know that story only too well. And I think it's important in these debates about, maybe the debate shouldn't be about why is it the German children should go and fight a war and Irish children don't? Maybe the debate should be about why any children have to go and fight a war. And I think there's no point in, to use a biblical reference, in pointing out the, the, the moat in somebody else's eye unless we recognise the beam in our own. And we are complicit, connected to the activities of what a now failed American empire over the last 20 years or so. Thanks very much, John. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I wonder who might want to respond to it. Yeah. No, there's a lot, a lot of point to do, right? But let me just uh, come back to the, the passing reference you made to NATO and, you know, on the, on the borders of Russia. I think it's very important. I, I agree entirely with you about the Iraq war. And by the way, you know, most of Europe opposed it. I mean, I remember very well uh, back in those days, the debates uh, with Chirac and Schroeder uh, and others who said this is an illegal war. So Europe was divided on the issue. There were, no, there were countries, but it, the, the, there were also many countries in Europe which, which opposed that war. So it was not as if everyone aligned. Uh, and the interesting thing, I think, about uh, Europe and the Americans is if you look at a number of the wars, particularly starting with the Vietnam War, where no European state joined, not even the UK was willing to send troops. The only country who sent troops to support the Americans was the Australians in the end. So America has, in my view, made some major mistakes. I think the invasion of Iraq, of Iraq was a catastrophe. And as I say, many in Europe opposed it. We were not united in our opposition. But to come back to NATO, and I think this is very important, there has been no aggression shown by any country in Europe. No aggressive uh, behavior except by Russia. I mean, we really need to nail this because if you want to say to me that somehow Russia is threatened, I'd like to know by whom. And the only reason why NATO expanded was because the countries formerly involved in the Soviet bloc felt threatened by Russia. And unfortunately, Mr. Putin on the 24th of February has shown them to be right. That this is a defensive alliance which offers no aggression, has never offered aggression. But Kosovo? Libya? Sorry, Kosovo was, was, they were situations where people intervened in order to try and stop a war. It was not to, it's it was not to, it's, it was in response to a conflict situation and it was an effort to stop genocide. And if you don't mind my saying so, I actually think that was the right thing to do. But I think the main point to be made here uh, in relation to that is that NATO is not an, an aggressive alliance and there would be no need for NATO expansion if people did not feel threatened by the Russian expansionism. And as I say, since, as Bridget pointed out, since Georgia, uh, since the, the um, uh, annexation of Crimea, the destabilization of the Eastern provinces, all Russian aggression, Russia is the only country that has annexed, has broken the Helsinki agreements and annexed by force a, a, a part of a sovereign neighboring country. That's the reality of the situation in which we find ourselves today. And I, I think really we have to look very sober, soberly at this and understand that for our Baltic states, for Poland, uh, for, for all the countries who border with, with Russia, this is a very, very scary moment because each one of them is asking, when could I be next? And so I'm sorry, that is the reality that we face in Europe today. Sorry, and and we, we, can, we, we cannot, we cannot. Here's some wars of aggression. So can I just, uh, NATO is not an empire. It's a mutual defence pact that countries voluntarily join. You can laugh, but that's the legal, and that's the legal position. And I think it's very easy, frankly, to sit in the comfort of Manus when we're very far away but if I was Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian, Finnish, Polish, and 
Hungarian and had remembered the rolling of the Russian tanks in, and I had an option as a citizen of one of those countries or the government of one of those countries to democratically and legitimately join NATO, you're depriving these countries of agency. And frankly, are you about that authority? And you're, no. sitting in, you're sitting in the same comfortable yeah, place. Yes, but, 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 but I, I am not saying that these countries are joining an empire when they join NATO. Now, your second point, you ended by saying, should we be appalled that children have to go and fight in any war? We should. War is brutal, nasty, and horrible. But... I know what we're talking But, but, but... If I were in Ukraine today, where the tanks came in and they didn't, they, they committed war crimes, they raised uh, cities and raped women and expropriated people to Russia itself. Well, frankly, if I were in Ukraine today, I probably would want to have the defensive capability to survive as a country because that's what, what is at stake for Ukraine. I fully agree with you on Iraq. It was an unjust war that should never have been fought. Yes, but the, the, any global perspective that sees the United States as the only problem in the international you system, in my, no, but it was no. the whole, most of the tenor of what you said was about American imperialism. I'm sorry, but that's because what... you spend an hour talking about Russian imperialism but, but, but the, without mentioning it. But the security threat in the part of the world we live in today comes from Russia. Without, without fear or favor or argument, it's their tanks, their army, and their forces that are bombing cities and raping women. Yeah. Their soldiers oh, are raping women. Sorry, John. I, I, I got Henry, Henry has asked to yeah. uh, respond, so I'm going to let Henry respond. And okay. Dave, Harry, you can come back. Okay, sure. I'd, I'd like to just point out first that it isn't true that I'm sort of, we've been spending the last hour talking about uh, nothing but uh, Russian aggression. Uh, a lot of my presentation was exactly about American power. If you look at the uh, discussion that I had, and this is something that myself and my co-author uh, we are, our book, which is coming out next year, the Irish uh, edition is going to be published by Penguin, is called Underground Empire, and it is precisely about the ways in which sort of US power has been spread through these various uh, instruments. That said, I think that this, you know, I think that this is a real problem, and I think this is a problem that it also came up in different ways. As Richard discussed, the you know, sort of question of uh, how um, sort of uh, Ireland and other countries should deal with American hegemony, it came up in other, you know, sort of David similarly, um, sort of made um, sort of suggestions. This is going to be an important problem for Ireland going forward, but I do not think that this is a good analysis of what is happening with Russia and Ukraine at the moment. And here I would refer to refer you to uh, my friend Matt Dust, who is a uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, foreign policy advisor, has a very good piece, which I just came out a few days ago. He, if there's somebody who's been fighting I'm sorry, the battle against the uh, automatic American instinct towards militarism in the uh, Middle East and elsewhere, it is Matt. And he makes a very strong case for why it is that the left ought to take a different attitude on Ukraine. I don't know if you're going to find this uh, convincing or persuasive, uh, but I do think that uh, if you want to see an argument about how this is not something, another automatic extrusion of US empire. And Matt is somebody who I think has the uh, credentials of pushing back against this and sort of the US foreign policy of fight over the last decade. And he makes a very strong case that I think you should uh, perhaps pay attention to and I think will be useful for you to read That's to get a sense. I have to agree with. Yeah. I, that this yeah. is part of the conversation in Ireland that I'm part of. Yeah. 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 Not part of yeah. Mary, okay. you wanted to ask a question. Um, yeah, um, it's just something that uh, David was saying earlier on about like, one of the reasons why we should be concerned about the Ukraine is because it's happening in Europe. But I don't think we really can abstract Europe from the rest of the world. Um, you know, Russia also sees, Russia considers, can consider itself to be a great power, and it considers itself to be on a par with the United States. And it sees the United States acting as a rogue state, not just in the Middle East, let's not forget about what happened in Latin America as well. I'm a Latin American specialist, the United States has been invading Latin, uh, Latin American um, states for uh, decades, if not a century. It's been interfering in Latin American elections on a regular basis. 
Um, it's been funding death squads in Latin America over many, many decades and many, many years uh, as part of the Cold War, which Russia was fighting against the United States. So Russia doesn't see this just in terms of Europe. Russia also sees this in terms of the whole world, and I think we should see the whole world as well uh, from that perspective as well. And I think it's very important to note that this is very much a northern war in the sense that the vast majority of developing countries are having nothing to do with it and don't want to have anything to do with it at all. Um, and they're staying out of it and trying to stay neutral. Um, and there's just one other point which is completely different, but it's something I want to pick Bridget up on, is that Bridget mentioned the influence of Putin on the radical right here in Europe. Uh, and maybe that's true, I'm not so sure, but if there's one um, uh, entity which has influenced the radical right in Europe and has been the Republican Party of the United States mm -hmm. and Donald Trump particularly. And this is not just, and this has been happening not just from Donald Trump but before Donald Trump as well. It's uh, uh, US think tanks and NGOs funding uh, anti women propaganda here in Europe and spreading anti women <laughs> propaganda here in Europe. And, shoring up um, radical right arguments against women's right to choose, against lesbians and gays, and also against immigrants. And that's coming from the United States, it's not coming from Putin, or at least not only from Putin. Oh. Or at least not only from Putin. But I think, you know, just blaming the emergence of the radical right on Putin and Putin alone is very much a one-sided uh, uh, point of view. I never said that. I never you said did. that. You, went, no, you, you said, uh, Bridget, sorry, excuse me. You said that the radical right that was related to Putin here in Europe, and you didn't mention the fact that also it's been funded by the United States and has been so for decades, and particularly the Re Republican Party of the United States. Um, when you say um, that Russia sees itself as a global power and has seen America doing you know, bad things around the world, I don't necessarily disagree. What possible justification does that give for invading Ukraine? Mm -hmm. I'm only trying to point out. Uh, well, sorry, I said what possible. I'm not trying to justify it. Well, then you, to you agree it, that the, yeah. the most immediate problem, no, the most immediate problem we face in Europe sorry, is, is, I'm is, is trying to what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that we should be trying to take that broader perspective, not just a narrow European perspective, in trying to understand why this war, war is actually happening at the moment. Well, sorry, it's, it's a narrow European perspective because the war is happening in Europe, and it's 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 a it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, Europe, it's a European from, company, it's a European country threatening every other country in Europe. You can't abstract this war from the global context. It's impossible. Right. Or at least it's, it's I don't know if anybody else wants no. to respond. Um, there are other questions, and I'm going to take them. Uh, Duncan first and then Ken. Thank you. My name is Duncan Nicholson. Um, I'm a graduate of the New University of History and Politics. I recently had a discussion with, I think it was an American citizen, who mentioned the fact that a number of countries, including the UK and the US, and I'm not too sure if it was Russia, guaranteed the borders of Ukraine on condition that Ukraine disarmed the nuclear weapons. And they were pointing out that once Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, nobody was, was prepared to protect those borders despite this agreement. I, I have mixed feelings about this because I had hoped to see the development of a discussion about Irish neutrality and what it was all about. Um, and I believe firmly that Irish neutrality, when it was first formed, had a particularly rigid, um, opportunistic, if I may say, um, uh, concept. But I think that Ireland now, and the, our speakers have accidentally put this across, that Ireland needs to step up to the plate. Um, I'm not sure whether NATO is, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure whether NATO is the way to go. I understand Finland, uh, Finland and I was there a few years ago and saw the, 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 the worries that Finland had about the rise of, of threats to them, sure. given the past. Um, but I do believe that the European the defense mechanism, we, we, in Europe, we need to be, in my opinion, more able to commit ourselves 
to our own defense, security and defense, and not always be depending sure. on bigger countries. That, uh, I, I just want to actually, to actually yes, to, to illuminate your point, Ben, the events of January this year, uh, where Ireland was really exposed internationally by the Russian military uh, maneuvers on the southwest coast. Then we have that episode with our fishermen who were going to bravely take on the Russians at one point. Uh, it was an embarrassment, was it not, for Ireland, and kind of underlines that point of being a free rider. The RAF patrols our skies, our European allies patrol our sea waters very frequently. Are we seeing any evidence of a new sort of thinking emerging in the Department of Defense? The government has committed to substantially increasing spending on defense. How are we likely to see that play out in the years to come? Well, we're still, as, as far as I understand, there's, there's still discussing between the Department of Defense and, and DFER as to what the, what the what the quantum might be in terms of in terms of defense expenditure. But I have to say, I mean, just to if I was to be hypercritical and just again as as provocation, I mean, the approach or, or what seems to be the consensus around the approach again seems to be rather half-assed because we're saying to ourselves and you know all of the opposition bar, bar one of the smaller opposition but all the opposition parties have agreed that Ireland needs primary radar primary radar to see what is in what is in the skies and what comes through our skies okay so we see what comes through our skies something's coming through our skies and we don't want what do we do then no we bought primary radar but you know what what then what then then either our security is delivered as i've said in another context other security is delivered by the kindness of strangers through the UK, RAF, L'Armée de l'Air from France, perhaps, if we had a bilateral agreement, or we decide that we're going to pay for it ourselves, or we decide we're going to have a formal alliance where at least, rather than relying on a nod and a wink with Her Majesty's Royal Air Force, at least we have a bilateral or multilateral agreement where we say that our air and our sea is defended by us. All I'm asking for is to make a choice. All I'm asking for is to have the conversation, have the debate, what kind of defense do we want? Do we want a neutral pacifist defense? And let's abolish the army, let's talk about civil disobedience, let's talk about a pacifist foreign security defense policy, or we pay for our own defense, three billion is the price tag we're given, or we have agreements with other people who provide our defense. My concern is, again, a half ass we promise ourselves we'll defend when we're not. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, Kevin Sade from University of Limerick. So I, I'm a Frenchman and actually looking at Ireland, I've been to Ireland for 14 years. I think one thing that is going really well for Ireland is actually the idea of the Citizens Assembly. And so I guess my question, you sort of answered that there, there I was wondering, um, what is the way forward? How to engage, continue the discussion? Do you think that the idea of a citizen assembly uh, is a good one? Yeah. My view, it's, it's really brilliant. Uh, uh, the the T-shirt has suggested very recently that we should hold a citizen assembly to tease out these issues around security commitments. Would it be a good idea, I guess, is the question. I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm rather partial because the, 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 one, of the, one of the parents of deliberative democracy, uh, 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 Professor Farrell, David yeah. Farrell, is, 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 is in my institution. Um, and I know people roll their eyes when we talk about, <laughs> talk about deliberative democracy and, and, and assemblies, but I think there's, there's utility there. Because again, as with you know, the assembly, the, the, the forum we had on, on abortion, it's a really tough and passionate subject upon which people have really, really tough and passionate views. And to have that kind of space within which you have a deliberative conversation, not throwing back accusations and, 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 and quotations, but a deliberative conversation, I think would be really useful. It would depend, however, if that was covered well, if there was real engagement, and if people bought into the idea itself. And that's that's a political job. Yes. Can I just add to that, that if there is such a discussion, so there's... Irish neutrality is not at stake to the extent that there is no pressure on Ireland either to join NATO or, in my view, to join anything called a common European defence because the said common European defence is uh, at best very embryonic. So the question for us as a country is what responsibility do we take for the security and defence of our country? And I do think with the prospect of a united Ireland, we also need to include in that the fact that part of the island of Ireland, because of, uh, of the United Kingdom, is also a NATO state. So there's a longer term issue there that needs to be looked at. I don't think that should necessarily be looked at in a, a citizens assembly just now, but should be looked at more broadly when, uh, when that 
as that agenda issue develops. I also think if there is um, a, a citizens' assembly, it should include discussion of security today, and that should include, therefore, the, the bigger issues around political economy as well. But of course, you can't stretch it so far that mm -hmm. then it ends up being about nothing. So I, but but we need to be, and the reason why, for example, a country like Finland, within a couple of months of the twenty fourth of of uh, February, uh, uh, submits its request to join NATO, is because it has a very extensive and very long border with uh, with Russia. And their intelligence services are listening all the time to us. They know Russia really well. They have the winter war. Their world is very different to ours. And I think one of the dangers in our country is that we think some are other, we're better than these other countries, but we're not. We're just luckier in this juncture, at this juncture, in historical terms. I mean, at an event Ben and I spoke at last week, there was an Estonian uh, an Estonian, uh, he's member of the Central Command in Brussels now in NATO, and his description of what faced his country in 1991 and the fact that they needed, from their perspective, to join NATO, from, in my view, was well-founded. Well-founded. And if I were Estonian, I would want the same thing. And if they weren't in NATO today, they'd have no defence at all. Um, just a few questions. There are quite a few. Senator Malcolm Byrne first. Thank, thank you very much, and thanks for uh, the, the engagement as well. Uh, I'm Malcolm Byrne. I'm a Fianna Fáil senator. My, my point relates really to the last question on the Citizens' Assembly and how we move this debate forward. Because if we ever discuss in Ireland defence and security policy, it immediately translates into is Ireland going to join NATO? Mm -hmm. uh, and even I'm conscious of, if you look at the opinion polls that have taken place over the, you know, the, the last number of weeks, the questions are not around defence and security policy. It is, do you favour Ireland joining, joining NATO? And it's a much broader uh, question. So it's, it's how we move on at that public, that public debate. There is a fear that in many ways, discussions around defence and security policy tend to be seen as a preserve of you know, academics and a small number of politicians, and I will say a small number because there isn't an engagement among, among most politicians uh, around uh, a, lot of, a lot of these issues. I think it's interesting, you know, most of the discussion on the Commission on the Future of the Defence Forces is really around terms and conditions in the Defence Forces. Uh, it's not around some of those, uh, th those, those broader uh, questions. My, my other point, I think, is relating to, uh, and I do get the point about that we are still dealing with boots on the ground, um, but our cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, and we need to remember that last year we experienced the biggest ever cyber attack on a health service anywhere in the world. Uh, you may or may not, depending on your definition, define that as a terrorist attack. Remember, it emanated uh, from Russia. The reality is, is that we are going to see increased cyber attacks uh, often, if not state-sponsored, they're going to be state-condoned. We are in no way capable uh, of dealing with it. And to Henry Europe, your earlier point, we store 30% of Europe's data in this country. Uh, you know, that immediately makes us uh, a target. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely worried that, that from a cybersecurity perspective, we're not going to be able uh, to defend ourselves. But I think our biggest challenge uh, is around you know, how we get you know, this debate out to a wider audience. It also features, and just to, to find it to, to David's point around, you know, the, the, the momentum of the climate change issue. Uh, you know, you talk to most people, they say they're, they're concerned about climate change, but when you talk about the real changes on the ground, oh, no, 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 that's going to cost too much, you're not going to move on, on those issues. And I think it's some of the same challenges we face uh, with regard to uh, defence and security policy. Thanks very much, David's point. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I mean, I agree entirely with your first point, Senator, that look, we need to take NATO out of this discussion because, as Bridget said, as I, there's no pressure on us to join NATO. No one cares whether we join NATO or not, and we don't have to, and I don't think it is the immediate issue, to be honest. I do agree with Bridget that going forward in terms of a United Ireland, that question will present itself, but it's not, we're not there yet. The, the immediate debate is exactly the two questions that are really the emphasis here. One is, how do we defend ourselves? I mean, you know, we look around the world and we say, what is our capabilities? You mentioned cyber as a huge vulnerability. You're absolutely right. 
uh, the, 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 the airspace and the, 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 the seas around us are other vulnerabilities, but also, frankly, our capacity for territorial defense when you look at what's happening in Ukraine. It does make a difference whether you are a country who can offer sustained resistance to any attempt to, to, to uh, invade your territory. We have to think about that. But the broader issue is how do we fit in a broader picture of European security, a Europe which is trapped in geographically where we are, but with huge dependence on our immediate neighborhood uh, to the east, but also uh, Africa, which is, of course, part of our neighborhood, uh, and uh, in, in a world between the US and China, and how you define that security in the broad terms uh, that um, Henry has done. And I think that's, that's where we need to start the discussion. Uh, and and what, what kind of tools do we need in order to equip ourselves to be better able to face the situation, including participation in, in European activities? But I would argue that the difficulty we have is that we've never had this conversation. Mm -hmm. And half the time, people are not even equipped to have the conversation because, as you say, they quickly fall into, I don't want to join NATO. Fine. Well, Let's put NATO aside. Let's almost forget about it for a moment. Let's just talk about what are the security threats to this island and how do we protect ourselves and what are the instruments at our disposal, whether that is what we can do for ourselves, what we need to do with European partners, how we associate with others in order to uh, defend ourselves against threats which were, are too great for us to face alone. And most of the threats we face, honestly, are too great for us to face alone. Well, Oleg had a question on Kiron. So, yes. Um, my name is Oleg Chuprina. Uh, I'm a PhD student with the Department of Sociology and originally I'm from Ukraine. So, first of all, I want to thank you very much all for your very interesting and insightful presentations. Mm -hmm. And my question is to Professor Lapa. Uh, I actually agree with almost everything you said, uh, and especially when you said that Europe actually failed to um, foresee the coming war and I, I, I would like you to maybe speak a little bit about corruption in, in, in your opinion what to what extent corruption within the European Union and broader Europe played in, in this failure? Okay. So I'm not a specialist on corruption, so I don't want to pretend knowledge that I don't have. But I do think it was extraordinary that Gerhard Schroeder moved from being Chancellor of Germany to his position with the, quite the speed that he did. So I think there was a huge problem and, and there remains a, a genuine challenge for Germany in that there's a disconnect in Germany between the political economy model that they have, which is reliance on relatively cheap or cheaper Russian energy sources. And Nord Stream 2 was basically very undermining of the interests of Ukraine and Poland, but they didn't, they ignored that. Uh, and also uh, the political economy with China. So the trading state and the fact that Germany's security is still very dependent on NATO and on the United States. So there's a misalignment. So I think, uh, yes, there is a problem, a huge problem across Europe of, but not just in the EU, but of course in the city of London and also in Zurich uh, on, on dirty money. And, and the, the, in, in my view, one of the biggest problems of uh, globalization was the uh, freeing of, uh, of, of financial controls. In other words, that that was where, when, when money could flow with the ease in which it did, it inevitably brought and still brings uh, a lot of corruption with it. I think for Ukraine, uh, for, for the rest of Europe, it's really important that Ukraine has a European future. I think that really matters, not just to Ukraine, but to the rest of Europe. And that means that Putin can't win this war. What that means, of course, on the battlefront is another matter and what, what political circumstances surround that. Uh, again, it's very uncertain just now. But if Russia if Russia, 
if Russia destabilizes Ukraine to the extent that it can't function as a functioning democracy and economy, then I think that's very bad news for particularly the countries in East Central Europe. And the nearer you are to Russia, the more dangerous that is. So there's an awful lot at stake. And, and I would add, there's a really deep fragility about the Western Balkans as well. Yeah. And we've kept it at a yes. blue, hoping that it wouldn't explode. Yeah. And there's a lot of danger there, similarly. Kiran. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Kiran B. And I'm recently finished my undergraduate studies here in Madrid. I was a student of Professor O'Brien. I'm also a graduate of the Washington Ireland program, for those who are familiar. My question was for David, but I'd appreciate the views of the other panelists as well. Uh, David, you spoke of the threat of the 2024 US election and the possibility of the election of a president who isn't as favorable to transatlantic ties. I want to ask you, what do you think Europe's security landscape will turn into if the introduction of a president who wasn't as favorable to transatlantic ties? What will Europe do? There's a possibility in that scenario that the US would pull out of NATO. What does Europe's security landscape look like in that scenario? Well, I mean, we know that um, John Bolton said about last year, I think, that um, he was convinced that if Trump had had a second term, he would have taken America out of NATO. Uh, we don't know that for certain. We certainly know that President Trump viewed the Article 5 commitment of NATO as elastic, to say the least. Um, and I think we have to be prepared for the fact that we could have a president in, in the White House who would not necessarily stand by the Article 5 NATO commitment in the way that President Biden has unequivocally stated the US would. The conclusion for Europe is we need to be more autonomous in the sense we need to be better able to stand on our own two feet. And as a very minimum, I leave aside the nuclear issue for the moment, because the only independent nuclear deterrent in Europe at the present time is France. The British nuclear deterrent is not really totally independent because it's under uh, an American lock and key. Um, the, and that's, that's a problem because the, the, the imbalance in the, in the nuclear equation is, is pretty terrifying if you think about it. On the other hand, I think, again, on, Ukraine has shown that actually traditional conventional warfare is still an issue. And we need to be absolutely in a position to offer a level of deterrence which would make it unthinkable for anyone such as Putin to want to in, in, in encroach on our on our territory. I think the more we do that, the less likely it is that even a Trump-like president in the United States will want to completely withdraw because part of the feeling of it is, well, the Europeans aren't willing to take enough responsibility. And it's not only about how much we spend, it's the, it's the, 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 the quality of that spend. Cumulatively, our defense budgets added together of the 27 member states are the second largest defense budget in the world. We have, I think, one and a half million people in uniform. Nobody thinks that that translates into a military capability which is equivalent to those numbers. And that's where, that's where the only answer to that is more European cooperation, more pooling and sharing. Not everyone needs an aircraft carrier. Not everyone needs heavy lift capabilities. Not everyone needs certain types of, of, of military equipment. We need, to, we need to be working more on that, the interoperability, reducing the number of systems. These are all things in which we can simply improve the efficiency of our military capability without spending vast additional sums on it. But we have to establish a, 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 a capacity in Europe to pose a really <coughs> good deterrent to anyone who is tempted to, to use force to change the existing frontiers. That's the starting point. There are then wider implications because, as we saw with Trump, uh, a move towards American unilateralism uh, in, in trade, in all other issues, will pose huge challenges uh, for us. The only thing I would say is that the massive economic interdependence between the United States and Europe remains a fact. And it's, 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 it's a fact which is not going to change anytime soon. It's not so much a trading relationship as an investment relationship. And the degree of cross-investment is absolutely massive not comparable to any other uh, uh, economic corridor in the world. So that is going to create, nonetheless, a sense of interdependence between the United States and Europe, which is going to continue for time. And that does give us some leverage with someone in the White House, provided we remain united and we do not allow ourselves to be picked off individually, because that's exactly what Trump tried to do, didn't really succeed. But it will certainly be what uh, somebody in that, of that mindset would try to do in the future. 
just to add on to that, I think uh, it's interesting uh, if you're looking at the second part of what David was talking about here, to look at a report that came out about two or three years ago from the European Council on Foreign Relations, authored by uh, uh, Rapnui and Ellie Granmaya, which uh, talked about and sort of what Europe needs to do in response to uh, US unilateralism. This report, I think, very clearly reflected a uh, thinking that was happening in uh, the French and German government at the time and laid out a set of options by which the uh, EU would uh, perhaps try to build up its own sort of counter capabilities in order to push back against US unilateralism. So we saw some of this sort of in somewhat unsuccessful experiments, such as the INSTEX mechanism, which was supposed to allow for uh, some degree of trade with Iran, despite what the United States uh, wanted to do. We're also seeing this in debates around the anti-coercion mechanism, which is going through the uh, European Union's uh, tortuous legislative process at the moment, albeit with a, uh, I think, a considerable degree of uncertainty among people as to whether this is a mechanism that they ever actually want to invoke. Instead, we're prepared to have, prepared to have it as a saber that they could rattle in the event that they feared that on sort of a uh, new unilateralism was being threatened against them, either by the US or by China. But all of these instruments sort of reflect, I think, a, a certain degree of thinking about how it is that the EU needs to have some degree of an insurance policy against the possibility of a second uh, term by somebody like Trump, who has effectively said that he sees the EU as being the adversary of <coughs> Somebody who uh, might not be quite as blunt about it, uh, but uh, you, know, you could see, for example, uh, the Satis or another uh, Republican uh, politician uh, being less crude in the rhetoric, but adopting policies which have uh, similar consequences and a similar de de degree of disregard for European interests. And this is provoking, I think, a certain amount of thinking, albeit I'm sort of in the uh, long-term planning parts of the uh, governments rather than in the uh, here is what we need to do right now uh, because of course that has taken up with short-term issues such as Ukraine. Yeah. Just one sentence, the only thing worse than Trump is a smarter Trump. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have about seven or eight minutes. I know that there is a person at the back who's been trying to get in and can't quite see. Oh, here. Right, fine. Thank you very much. Here, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, my. Uh, Kieran is my name. I, I work in um, the Edward Kennedy Institute for Conflict Intervention here, here in the University and the Department of International Just a question. Our point really regards to emotion and identity within this. And I think just that, you know, the decision with regards to the tense that they are, it can be perceived as uh, economic identity as well as political I issues. And that, um, that the intellectual arguments are been well made here, but the emotional draw that uh, people need to have when they commit to defence or to, you know, uh, for, for people's lives are on the line, that the geopolitical aspects of this really haven't reached down. And, you know, data centres and protection of all of that cyber technology isn't ultimately what most people think about in a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, in their lives. And that EU identity ha has a bit to go with regards to drawing that aspect or drawing people into, in, into that. And I must say I'm a huge you know, advocate of, of, of all of this, but I feel that somehow we're left short. The institutions and the capabilities are, are, are moving along very swiftly, but the common person on the street uh, who will support this ultimately, because at the moment our polls indicate that only a third of people really are drawn to the, this type of thinking. So um, I just uh, want to make a comment on wonder what the point, what the plan of thinking that. And yeah, um, we'll actually link to that. Uh, so hi, my name is Yelena Radkovich. I can uh, put a shuffle of different things, but I am actually one of Ben Conrad's uh, Supervisees in UCD. Um, I worked in the European Parliament, I worked in the United mm -hmm. Nations, I'm from Serbia originally, um, and I'm working on a Europe, the question of European identity. Um, and I have taught a lot uh, within universities in Ireland, and uh, this year specifically, I was teaching uh, Irish state and society here in the news. And this, the, the issue that I found a lot uh, within Ireland, and we are talking about Ireland in the European space, because that is inevitably something that has to always be linked, is this lack of awareness of the Irish importance in Europe and being part of Europe. So maybe it is a bit of an 
I guess, our mentality that could be, you know, cause of that, but as well just the fact that there isn't a communication enough or discussion, of course, there is discussion here in the news, but between, you know, ordinary people, I guess, uh, who will be reflecting on the issue of defense, neutrality, migration, and so on and so forth. So we mentioned the Citizens' Assembly is one of the solutions to, to the issue of this uh, lack of communication and awareness of, of the space that we're in. But I would like to ask the panelists what might be one or two other things that I mean, Professor Lappin mentioned as some of the institutional um, uh, kind of changes that need to be uh, pushed. But as well, I would like to ask you what you would you know, suggest as well, both as academics, but as policymakers, that we should um, work on both in Ireland and Europe to raise this awareness. And sorry, John, there's one more down here. It's okay, John, honestly. Yes, please. Sorry, I'm just okay. trying to write on the side. Oh, right. 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 I see you, it is me. How are you doing? Uh, just sat in the wrong place. Hello, everybody. This is yes. a real pleasure. I'll be very quick. Barry Palfer from the Institute of International and European Affairs. There's a longer question. I'm going to truncate it as quickly as I can. Ben and to Bridget. Uh, given Ireland is likely to join a small group of small countries in the EU alongside Malta, Austria, I believe, as the military and online ones, and given our support for what Bridget said, our support for Ukraine's European future, are we likely to lose any goodwill? I'm sorry, John, for doing this, but uh, just I have a few that are coming in from live stream, yes. um, and a couple have been already dealt with in relation to the ideas of the Citizens' Assembly seems to come up quite a lot. But somebody wondering about what happens if Russia did win the war, and what impact would that have on some of the strategic issues being discussed? And another asking, is there any learning from the EU process in relation to Brexit and the degree to which the 27 states negotiated, uh, you know, so closely on that? Some of the other ones are overlapped, and apologies to others who haven't been able to get in. Thank you very much indeed. So I'll come back to our speakers in no particular order if you want to tackle some of those questions. Ben. Yeah, if I can, I can, I can, I can, I can put a couple, of, a couple of them together. Yeah. Um, on the emotion identity question, I mean, I'd be very frank, and this is just a personal view, not a, not a, not an intellectual view as such. You know, I have no affinity with the idea of you know dying for Europe. Um, I have no desire to see a European nationalism supplant or even be added to an Irish nationalism or a British nationalism or Belgian nationalism. So it's not a shift and change in identity that I think is, is, is either desirable or, or likely, but it is about solidarity. It is about fellow feeling and partnership and engagement. And to that extent, the Brexit question comes in. Because again, we went to our European partners. We said, this is an existential threat to us, a threat to our security, a threat to our peace process, a threat to something that is precious and to us. We need your support and solidarity. And they paid a specific economic cost for that. They could have had a much better deal with the UK that wouldn't have imposed the kinds of economic costs that some of our partners have done. And now we turn around and Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania say, you know, we need to talk about our security and defense. We have an existential threat. We see what Russia has done in Ukraine. What Ireland are you going to do? And our response is, well, we'll send you helmets, but we won't send you guns. Now, that's not about nationalism. That's not about a new European identity and fighting for 12 starry flags. It's about a basic civilizational compact that you have with partners with whom you have agreed to share a future with. Now, again, if we don't want to share that future, fine. If we want to pull out of the European Union, fine. If we want to marginalize ourselves in the European Union, fine but at least have the honesty, honesty and decency to have the conversation and be conscious of the costs and benefits of making those decisions, rather than lie to ourselves and tell ourselves we're committed and good Europeans, ash or butt. Because again, that half-assed approach, I don't think will suffice. Um, just by way of summation, if I could, um, I just want to ask each of the panelists, perhaps for a brief final um, response. Um, do you agree that the 24th of February might prove to be an epochal moment for Europe in the same way that 1989 was that year of epochal change? In the summer of 1989, very few people predicted that the Soviet Union wouldn't exist a few years hence. So there were all kinds of 
things that happened, that old thing about nothing happening for decades and then decades happening in a day, will the 24th of February prove to be that significant, Henry? I think yes. I think it was an extraordinary moment. I do think that it's the usual kind of, uh, you, know, you, you know, there's a big hoolie and then there's a hangover the following morning. Uh, so that I think that there's a certain degree of, you know, sort of, you know the sudden speeches, von der Leyen, Bjorn Siebert and others and sort of uh, coordinating with the United States to bring forth these quite unprecedented sanctions, um, sort of the move in Germany. All of these things you know, sort of, uh, are um, sort of decisions which were taken in haste and to some degree uh, are being repented at leisure. But nonetheless, I think that there has been a basic shift in how Europe understands itself. I think that the one most interesting um, sort of political phenomenon, I think, is the German Greens. I think that uh, if you're looking at what is happening in Europe and where ideas are coming from, where you, whether you like them or you dislike them, they're not coming from the SPD or the uh, CDU or whoever, or other um, sort of mainstream parties. It's the German Greens who are forging this new and very interesting, complicated mixture of left environmentalism with strong defense of democracy as a principle. Lots of things that they haven't worked out with regard to you know, sort of nuclear power thing is a, a, sort of a, an open question. Military uh, uh, force is also something, but there's something interesting fermenting there. And I think that um, sort of one of the key questions for me, is, uh, there are two questions, sorry, I'm being too long. One is uh, the sanctions package, uh, sort of, as Richard mentioned, the sixth sanctions package was where the hungry thing came out. But there also was an interesting thing that was much less regarded, which is the uh, effort to use a shipping insurance market. Yes. Yes. Which is, I think, one of your. So, so the EU has maintained for a long, long time that secondary measures, secondary sanctions are illegal and are to be. Uh, and this is the EU tiptoeing towards some degree of secondary measures or something like that without quite saying so. I think that this is something very interesting to watch and to follow <laughs> and to see whether it builds into something else. And the second question, I think, is a question of the energy transition. To what extent this does provoke a change in the physical materiality of how power is distributed and, uh, and uh, transported, which could uh, sort of answer some of the questions about corruption by providing a different energy model. But here again, there are difficult questions which the United States is confronting at the moment about, for example, Chinese domination of uh, batteries, of photovoltaics, and other uh, things that are crucial to the energy transition. Uh, Biden uh, yesterday issued an order basically saying we're going to go with Chinese capacity for the moment. Europe is going to have to make similar decisions in which way it should jump, I don't know. But that, again, is, a, I think, something that you know, infrastructural decisions have decade-long and sometimes century-long consequences, and that's where I think a lot of the action is likely to be. I should say that the, the wonderful new series of Borgen, the Danish yes. Prime Minister, yes. the yes. all these themes of geopolitics and the challenge for small states of balancing relationships with the US, China, and Russia, they're all there and it's absolutely absorbing. Um, I'll come to you next, David, perhaps, just for a final comment. And then I mean, on your question about the 24th of February, uh, I'm inclined to say, as Charles Chow and I said, Henry Kissinger, maybe it's a bit too soon to tell. I mean, potentially, yes, it's, 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 it's it's hugely important, but of course we could have, you know, the, the, the 1st of July could suddenly, you know, the whole thing escalates. I mean, we just don't know where this is going. Uh, so I think and it does have a questioner suggested what happens if Russia wins? Well, I don't think Russia can win at this point. Russia has basically lost. They can, they can do a lot more damage. That they can they can inflict a lot more pain and suffering uh, in Ukraine, but they can never win. They cannot conquer Ukraine. That has been demonstrated. The the, the, the number of troops they would need to control the entire Ukrainian uh, territory is beyond them, both militarily and financially. So Russia can't win. But I do agree that you know they could inflict a lot of pain and suffering, even more so on on the on the on the Ukrainian people. So that's what we have to watch. I, I think, if I may, to our Serbian colleague, I, I think for us in Ireland. The key question is, how do you put all this together in a vision of our role in Europe, which is slightly different from that which we had previously? I, I think that's the challenge we face. It can't simply be business as usual, which is largely seeing Europe as being about, frankly, economics and, and economic benefits and you know, playing both sides against the middle by being able to also keep a close relationship with the United States. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I, I think the more you look at it, the more you see that geographically we are where we are. 
as something which Brexit sort of denies. And, and we are totally reliant on what happens with the rest of this continent. And we need to be right in there, engaged, willing to commit, and also contributing to shape what this Europe becomes faced with the threat from Russia, faced with the, 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 the binary choice between the US and, and, and China. And, and that's, that's the big issue facing us. And we need, the debate we need here is to see that bigger picture and not, not just to divide it up into a discussion about NATO or a discussion about you know, tax or whatever. It's that bigger picture because that's really the choice we're gonna face in the next few years, quite suddenly, I think. Bridget. So I think the 24th of February was a, a transformative moment in the first sense that it was a clarifying moment because a lot of the issues, energy vulnerability, the need for strategic autonomy, uh, def Europeans' responsibilities in defence and security, the, the, the nature of cooperation and competition with the United States, all on the table. They've been on the table for a very long time, but it was clarifying to the extent that the they, they, they have generated a series of choices about all sorts of things, and Henry mentioned uh, several of them. So choices, urgency, and very compelling. Uh, we're in it. Also, I think a realization of wa a wake-up call for Europe, those countries further from Moscow, about complacency and the idea that somehow or other you, do, you can do business with, with, with Putin. Uh, and so I think, and then of course, another clarifying moment would be, in my view, uh, the 24 US election, and if it delivers to the White House someone who is not sympathetic to NATO or the transatlantic alliance. For Ireland, really serious choices. We actually have more time because broadly, although if you think of the political economy challenges, perhaps we have less time, but we really need to have a grown-up discussion in this country about how this small state anchors itself in the world and what resources capacities it has and its responsibility not just to itself but to others uh, and uh, uh, Barry asked would we use, lose European goodwill I think we can in certain circumstances and the one instance recently where the instinct was right, was on that European recovery fund, where there could have been a danger that we'd have gone with the Hansestädte and the, the Frugal Four, and even our Department of Finance understood. I think that's, that's for me, was a very telling moment that Ireland did not, that it signed that letter of the nine and aligned itself with a broader consensus within the EU. Uh, I think that showed me that there is, at least at the level of reflex, that there's life in the system. And finally, very, very quickly, in, in response to Barry, I, I, don't think, I don't think you're looking at a loss of goodwill, because I don't think member states necessarily would expect us to do anything different unless we choose to. What, I, what I'm fearful of is the marginalisation I spoke of earlier, that we simply drift and drift and drift further from the, further from the centre. Again, we can do that consciously, but assess the costs and benefits. With respect to our, you know, implications of a Russian win, I agree with David, Russia's already lost. The best case scenario for Russia is to freeze the terms of that loss, as they have done in Moldova, as they have done in Georgia, as they have done elsewhere. Um, and the only reason, or 99.9% .9 reason, that the Russians have lost is by grace of the Ukrainian people. Um, and I think there's one hell of a debt there to be owed. Um, and then the final point is, in terms of ep epochal uh, comparators, for me, it's not 89.90, it's not 9.11, it's 38.39. That's, that's the historical comparator in my terms, 1938-1939. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, I just want to sum up in two minutes, if I can, and in particular, <laughs> uh, express some thanks. <laughs> we began this semester in this very room with a seminar on, in early February talking about Ukraine and what was likely to happen. Um, I think in some senses this event has brought us full circle after all these uh, sort of dramatic developments in the intervening period. I want to thank some people. Firstly, our colleague Anne Hamilton Black, who has done the most extraordinary work with us and for us over the last couple of years, especially during the COVID hiatus where we were able to hold events and 
reach people all over the world. That was very important, and we really appreciate what Anne and Dorla and her colleagues at the Maynooth Institute for Social Sciences uh, have done for us and with us in that time. So thank you very, very much, Anne. I'd also like to thank my department, the Department of Sociology, in particular our head of department, Professor Mary Murphy. Uh, it's a wonderful department to work in, and uh, we've had nothing but better support from Mary and from previous heads uh, over the years. I'd also like to thank our Dean of Social Sciences, Dr. Mark McGuire, for his support for our center over the last number of years. Um, I'd like to thank our audience. It is really wonderful to see people back in-house and present in every sense. And it's always quite competitive uh, in uh, the responses from uh, the audience. I'd also like to thank those who have joined us online, who weren't able to be here. It's great to be able to offer that option and to include people in the conversation in Ireland, beyond the university and beyond the country. Finally, my greatest bet is to our speakers, to Henry, Ben, Bridget, and David. Thanks so much for what was an expansive, really illuminating, stimulating conversation. And let's hope it's the beginning in the Irish context of a much broader academic and societal and policy-driven conversation about where Ireland fits in, in European and international terms. So thank you all very, very much indeed.